Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Romans, chapter 12, verses 9 through 21. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope, be patient in trouble, and keep on praying. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Be happy with those who are happy, and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people, and don't think you know it all. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. If your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's start with prayer, right? Okay. God of abundant grace, help us hear from you where we need to work on our ability to love today so that we can be more like Jesus and shine his light in this world that invites all to your family table. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be so pleasing to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, I had an argument with my oldest son a couple of weeks ago. He's 18 now, six foot three, and just graduated from high school this past spring. I know he feels like he's grown up, in a lot of ways. And he's been trying to get enough money together that he can move out of the house and move out of state with a couple of friends. And, and he's just been running into a lot of things that he feels like there's just stuff holding him back. And, and I think like a lot of people, especially people his age, graduating in a pandemic or trying to start school in a pandemic, um, he's worried about his future and what it holds. And so a couple of weeks ago, I think there was just some underlying stress, and he's living at home with Roger and I and his younger brother Dylan, and we've talked a little bit about younger siblings and how annoying we can be, so just imagine that going on too. So our argument that day was actually, it was a big misunderstanding. It was triggered by all things of me asking a question. He was really excited about a sticker that he had acquired, and it was a sticker for a skateboard company, and he held it out to show me the artwork, and, and I noticed it was cool, but there was something kind of odd about the lettering that I, I didn't quite get. And so with my background in graphic design, I, I look at things in a pretty analytical manner, and I'm just asking questions out of trying to understand. But the way I asked it, or how it hit, or where he was at in his mind that day, it just it didn't go over well. His face grew cold, and his eyes narrowed, and he said, you're stupid. And then he went on to angrily tell me why I was stupid. And then he slammed his door as he went into his bedroom. Now, to my recollection, he had never talked to me that way before. And I knew that I had never talked to him that way before. And so, as you can probably imagine, this did not go over well in my book. So his younger brother was in the room during this very brief exchange, and, and he did say something to Caden in my defense, which I thought was amazing. Um, I think it was along the lines of how completely inappropriate it is to talk to your mother that way. Thank you, Dylan, if you're watching. So I was really surprised, and I was kind of angry myself when this happened, and I had a hard time finding very many words until after I heard the door slammed. 
And then I was just left trying to figure out what happened. And I have to admit, my first thought, as my own emotions kind of whooshed up through me, um, my own thought was to just leave the house and just be somewhere else rather than deal with his stinky attitude. But I also now knew deep down inside that he would just be left with his stinky attitude and I would be taking mine with me wherever I went. And in my mind, life is too short to live with a stinky attitude. We needed more than that. We needed to seek understanding. We needed to try to make some peace. So long story short, I pushed for more conversation and we realized what had happened was actually confusion caused by the gender gap. <laughs> He apologized and admitted he overreacted, and we even had a really good conversation after that. But it was kind of hard to get there. That interaction the other day also reminded me of myself when I was just a year older than Caden, when I was a sophomore in college. I had a major falling out with my dad, but it wasn't over in an hour. It took a few years. Now, he and I had never really gotten along great, he was a hard-working veterinarian, dealing largely with cattle, sheep, and other livestock, plus pets of all kinds. He was also a pig farmer, so having a dad who worked in those areas meant that, um, just like my two older sisters, well, we hauled a lot of grain and we hauled a lot of manure. <laughs> There's always plenty of work to do. And while I was growing up, it just seemed to me that he was angry all the time. It seemed like it was his primary emotion. And looking back, I think it was likely financial pressures and the stress of, of aging and a physically demanding and potentially dangerous business. I didn't really like being around him those years. I avoided him. And when I was around him, I was extra careful to try not to trigger him. I would just do what I was told and try to anticipate what he might need. And when he would blow up about, I don't know, an animal getting loose or something else going wrong, I would just stand by silently and wait for it to blow over. Well, he would sometimes honestly use a really large collection of curse words in a really colorful way, and sometimes get violent and hit things or throw things. So one day when I was a junior in high school, so actually younger than Caden is now, we were feeding some cows out in the clinic when he started to erupt as a heifer tipped over her bucket of grain. And something inside of me broke open and I couldn't stop it. Scared to death because I had never done such a thing before, I yelled at him. I said, do you really think that's going to make it better? I could tell. I could tell that he was shocked that I'd say anything. But he stopped. He turned around and he made some angry comment and he left the clinic for me to finish cleaning up. We never talked about that day. But I remember being shocked that what I said actually had an effect on him. After so many years of just being around his anger, anger, I, I, I didn't know what to do with it at the time. A few years later, when I was in college, unfortunately, other things happened to continue to damage our relationship. And I got to the point where I was drained of all respect for him. It's really hard to talk about your dad when you're talking about evil. But I know that everybody's experience of parent and child is different. Coming together for family meals at that time was kind of brutal. If he said anything halfway disrespectful to my mom or my sisters or anything, either in word or tone, I would just dump, jump down his throat. I was going to have none of it, not anymore. He was not going to do that while I was around. I'm not sure who made me judge, jury, and firing squad, but I was ready all the time. It made for some uncomfortable dinners, I can tell you that. Our, our table was not necessarily a welcoming place when I was there. All the years I had walked on eggshells, and now I was doing it to others. So years later, I finally realized I had to let go of my anger. God was working on me. I knew I needed to forgive and reach out to my dad if I was ever going to have a solid relationship with him or with any other man. And I had just met this guy named Roger, and I didn't want to mess it up. 
I called my mom to warn her because she usually answered the phone, and I was going to start calling home just to talk to him, and I didn't want her to be hurt by that. I wasn't going to talk to her any less, but I needed him to see that I was making a point to call him, just him, on the phone. I told him what I was doing, that I was trying to build our relationship, and I did. I started to call him. Now, Dad wasn't sure. <laughs> Wasn't sure what to make of it, I don't think, and I'm not sure that I'd ever really had a conversation with him before this point. <laughs> and the funny thing is, is we always ended with me saying, "Love you, Dad," and he would always reply, "Yup," or "Uh huh," or something like that, and then he'd hang up. And I know that it's, you know, there's a, a certain generation that it's just not common, and certain families they don't say those words. But I was going to try. So I sent him cards and I sent him letters in the mail. I even made him take me fishing, because that was a new hobby he started after I moved out of the house. And it's not that I cared about fishing, but I knew he did, and I cared about him. So I don't know how long we did this, but I do remember finally one day, nearing the end of a phone call, he said, "Love you." Even before I'd said it first, I think it just kind of popped out, <sighs> like he couldn't stop it. So it's a good thing I was already sitting down. I didn't remember him ever saying those words to me before. <sighs> Now our world, our society, can sometimes feel like it's coming apart at the seams these days. And if we aren't careful, it can seem like everywhere we look is anger and hate. People can be so quick to pick sides on just any issue, and it's leading to a defensiveness and an aggressiveness that is not of God. Are there things that need to change about our world? Absolutely. Are there people and causes that need to be uplifted? Absolutely. But can we get to a more loving world without striking back at our enemy? Both Paul and Jesus say yes, and as Christians, that is the way we are called to do it. When Paul tells us to love others like members of your family and all the other things in this passage, he's calling us to believe that whoever we consider an enemy. Is really someone with whom we should want a relationship. That getting to a time when we can sit down and eat at the same table together is something we believe can happen, and it is something for which we're willing to work, for which we're willing to persistently sacrifice, because that is what Jesus would do. But friends, in all seriousness, just to make a note of a very important related issue. If you or someone you know is a victim of domestic abuse, I am not at all saying that the victim needs to wait it out in the home until their family member changes. No, I would encourage somebody who's dealing with that to seek protection and counseling. Sometimes we need earthly professional help to reach God's kingdom here on earth, and sometimes we need to acknowledge the healing of relationships may not come while we are yet on this earth. But that said. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans chapter five, verse eight: "While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us." That statement makes me think about all the changes he went through, Paul went through in his life, as shared with us in Scripture. So, as a recap, the first time we hear about a young Pharisee and Roman citizen named Saul is in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter seven and eight. There we read that Saul looks on with approval and is the coat check guy as Stephen, the first Christian martyr, is stoned to death by an angry mob. Stephen had had been preaching about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to the high Jewish court, and he paid for it with his life. In Acts seven verses fifty nine through sixty, it reads, "As they battered him with stones, Stephen prayed, 'Lord Jesus, accept my life.'" And falling to his knees, he shouted, "Lord, don't hold this sin against them!" And then he died. Stephen showed love to his tormentors while facing their evil actions, 
just as Jesus did when he died upon the cross. And yet witnessing that didn't have an immediate effect on the proud Pharisee, Saul. He went on from there to not just watch coats at stonings, but lead the persecution of Christians, dragging followers of the way, both men and women, into prison. Saul was on his way to Damascus with letters from the Jewish high priest, authorizing him to arrest Christians there when he was suddenly blinded on the road by the resurrected Christ. His life was reclaimed. He was renamed from Saul to Paul, and his purpose changed from persecuting Christians to evangelizing them. Over his ministry then, he was imprisoned multiple times, beaten and left for dead, He was chased and was often on the run from authorities and angry mobs as he continued to spread the gospel. So when he finally writes the book of Romans, which we believe was toward the end of his ministry, he had had a lot of time to think about and refine his understanding of what it is to follow Jesus. I can't help but wonder if as he wrote the words of our scripture passage today, bless people who harass you, bless and don't curse them, that he was remembering Stephen's last words as he was dying. I can't help but wonder if he was remembering also his own early days as a proud young Pharisee when he thought chasing down Christians was fighting for God, only to discover years later on the road to Damascus that he had just never really understood who God was until he met Jesus. God isn't looking for us to judge our enemy He's asking us to do everything we can to bring them into the family, to get them to our table and sit down together by showing them Christ's love so that their hearts are changed. When we acknowledge and remember our own times of not knowing, our own stumbling in the dark, we can use it to help us understand just how confused that person throwing rocks at us might be. How do we get the best of evil? How do we defeat it? By showing it love. Returning the hate will get us nowhere good. If we want God to win, we have to do everything we can to show who he is while we are in battle. Amen and amen.